practitioner Sandra Kupo will give us some insights into answering some of those whys. She's prepared an encouragement which will stimulate you to change your thinking and watch your life change for the better. So open your eyes, your heart, and your vision. You're about to take off to the new you. Good morning, friends. Good morning, Sandra. And welcome to the Temple of Light, Center for Spiritual Living. It is an absolute joy for me to be here this morning and to bring you the message. I know and acknowledge this as a beautiful day. And I'm so grateful to be alive and awake and aware. Let us say that together. I am so grateful to be alive, awake, and aware. I'm so grateful to be alive, awake, and aware. Turn to the person nearest to you and say, thank you for sharing this day with me. Wow. You know, as stories go, there is a beautiful monastery tucked away at the top of a mountain somewhere in Spain. One of the fundamental requirements of this religious order is that the young monks must maintain silence. I'm sure you may have heard this already, but it's worth telling again. Opportunities to speak are provided once every two years, at which time they are only allowed to say two words. One young initiate in this religious order, having completed his first two years of training, was invited by his superior to make his first two-word presentation. Food terrible. And that was that, until two years later when the invitation came up again for him to share his two words. He used that forum to say, bed lumpy. Arriving at his superior's office two years later, that's now six years, he proclaimed, I quit. The superior looked at the young man and said, you know, it doesn't surprise me one bit. All you've done since you have arrived here is complain, complain, complain. Well, what if you were asked to share two words that describe your life? Would you focus on the lumps and the bumps and the unfairness? Or are you committed to dwell on those things that are good and right and lovely and true. Here's another example. There once was a woman who woke up one morning, looked in the mirror and noticed that she had only three hairs on her head. Well, she said, I think I will braid my hair today. So she did and she had a wonderful day. The next day she woke up, looked in the mirror and noticed that she had two hairs on her head. Mm, she said, I think I'll part my hair down the middle today. And she did. And she had a wonderful day. The next day when she woke up, she found that she only had one hair on her head. So she declared with great joy, I think I will wear a ponytail today. And so she did. And she had a fun, grand day. The next day, when she woke up, there were no hairs on her head. And she said, yay, I don't have to do anything to my hair today. So you see, it is all a matter of perspective. And that's the title of my encouragement this morning. It's all a matter of perspective. Perspective is a particular attitude toward or way of regarding something. It is, in effect, a point of view. We are all blessed with free will to choose any perspective or point of view 
we want about the occurrences in our lives. The challenge is that it is easier to focus on and complain about what we see as the bumps, the lumps, and the unfairness of daily living. Friends, when the heart is hurting, it is often difficult to see beyond the perceived cause of that hurt. We may find ourselves consumed with thoughts of worry and despair. It is almost as if we are hypnotized into acceptance of the status quo. Is so life go? We might say, as we struggle through, that's the way it is. Yet situations that cause suffering, poverty, and pain are common experiences in the human condition. And we are the ones who determine what we make of those experiences. Whether we see them as good or bad, it is all a matter of perspective. Or as Shakespeare says, there is no good or bad. Thinking makes it so. Just take the story of the farmer. This is one I know you've heard already from this podium, but it's a nice story and it proves the point. Once upon a time, his only horse ran away. And the villagers said, oh, that's too bad. The farmer shrugged it off and said, well, good, bad, who's to say? A few days later, the horse returned along with two beautiful wild mares. The villagers were so excited for the farmer's good luck and they told him so. So of course he replied, good, bad, who's to say? So the farmer's son, an adventurous young man as he was, tried to break in one of the mares and it threw him and he broke his leg. The villagers were so distressed and expressed their distress to the farmer. Of course he replied in his usual glib tone, mm, good, bad, who's to say? Well, the next day, the army came recruiting all the young men in the village to go off to war. But since the farmer's son had a broken leg, he couldn't go. And so he stayed home. And of course, the villagers again declared how good it was that his son didn't have to go to fight. The farmer once again said, good, bad, who's to say? Well, I know, I learned a long time ago that there is always a silver lining to every cloud. And good must come of everything that we label bad. I want you to reflect for a moment on something you might have labeled bad in the past, something that might have happened in your life. I'm sure that as you look at the situation from your present day perspective, you can see the good and the lessons learned that, you know, that has come out of that situation. For, this, for, for myself, the end of my marriage enabled me to blossom. Not having enough money made me extremely creative. And my son's blindness moved him into a whole new realm of conscious awareness. You know, our spiritual growth is often accelerated by setbacks in life, which are in essence setups for our greater good. Fighting or resisting what you are going through is likely to close you off to the gifts that such an experience is bringing. So even if you can't, can't see what that good is today or next week or next month, trust that it is so. It's all a matter of perspective. Life gives us everything we need for spiritual evolution. Every experience we have is an opportunity for us to learn something and blossom into a greater understanding of our divine nature. Change your thinking, change your life is one of the fundamental pillars of this teaching that we know as a science of mind. It does take a revolution in thinking to know something apart from what our five senses tell us. When we are filled with anxiety, right thinking enables us to recognize truth as the only way out. Until that happens, feel your feelings. You know, there is a, a story of a little girl who was throwing a tantrum in a bank. Of course, the bank was crowded and the mother was embarrassed. So she tried to get the little girl to stop crying. And the little girl stood up, put her hands akimbo, and looked up at her mother and said, Mommy, I am not finished my feelings yet. 
Then she threw herself back on the ground and continued to cry. So, friends, when we have the feelings, the anger, the sadness, the, the frustration, we need to allow ourselves to feel our feelings. Uh, it is a very important part of our spiritual growth. So, for me, I will feel, and then I cry, I pray, I cry some more, I pray again, and then the tears usually stop. And if they don't stop, I will find myself a practitioner, right? Because after your prayer, light always finds its way through the darkness of whatever the experience is, and it allows the tears to, to, to subside. But if that doesn't happen, I recognize that perhaps I'm too close to the situation, and then I will call on my practitioner. When we shift our thinking and contemplate truth, instead of fixing the appearance, we begin to understand what the master teacher taught us, that we are in the world, but we are not of it. When we approach our lives from this perspective, we are no longer concerned about any seeming problem before us, because we have risen above it. Such is the power of right thinking, that it cancels and erases anything unlike itself. It answers every question, it solves all problems, and it is a solution to every difficulty. So what past blunders might you have that's perhaps lurking in your consciousness that haunt or cast their shadow on your present? What will it take for you to find them, acknowledge them, and lovingly release them? It's important for us to be very gentle with ourselves as we do the inner work to heal and rise above any sense of struggle. I often tell myself that I might not be able to change the past, but I can change how the past affects the present and not let it dictate who I am. You know, Reverend Ray, uh, Dr. Raymond Anderson, we call him an honorary Jamaican. He's a friend of the Temple of Light. He asks, looking at your life today, right now, what are we invited to learn, to release, to realize, and to embody as we continue to live, laugh, and love as the eternal and infinitely divine, magnificent beings that we are? He reminds us that the more we embody the truth of our divinity, the more we experience the thing we call healing in all areas of our life. And we learn, of course, that there's nothing to heal. There is only God to reveal. But it takes a level of thinking to be able to do that, conscious thinking, and, and focus on what we know to be the truth. So I'm, I'm going to suggest a number of um, things that we can do to shift our perspective. First one is to be very consciously aware of our self-talk and the language that we use. The conversations with, that, that we have with ourselves is a direct reflection of our mindset. I personally dislike writing reports in, in my work. Hate, I mean, I don't want to use that word, but I really dislike writing reports. You can relate to that, right, Reverend John? Mm-hmm. And, and I find myself saying, oh my God, this is hard. It's like a 1,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. I will do the work and I will have all the pieces come together beautifully in the workshop. And then I have to put those pieces together in a report. I don't like it at all. Okay, so I tell myself, this is so hard. And because I tell myself this is so hard, my experience of writing the report is that it is hard. That thinking sets me up for the experience of struggle whenever I have a report to do. I've had to upgrade my mindset to something empowering like, I can do this, which really works. Or, what I've started to do in recent times, I get an assistant, somebody who comes to the workshop with me, and they take the notes, they put them together, and then I, in other words, they make big pieces out of the little pieces of the report, of the <laughs> workshop experience and then I put those big pieces together, and it is so much easier, okay? And so, doing that, finding something 
um, practical and you know, useful to the situation that helps in the changing of the mindset. The second thing is to determine the mindset that you need and act as if. Is it a mindset of prosperity, a mindset of peace, a mindset of, of, of love? So pick a goal that you want to achieve and ask yourself, what, what mindset would I need to achieve this goal? And which mindset do people have that those, you know, those people were successful in achieving a similar goal. Um, so, for example, if you want to be healthy and fit, you have to say things like, I love taking care of my body. That's a mindset. You have to love taking care of your body rather than seeing exercise as a chore. Right, honey? <laughs> well, you see, um, my friend Hanif here is very good at physical stuff, but he knows, knows how some of us struggle with keeping up with the physical stuff. But exercise, we have to have the mindset to want to make it happen. So this way we're basically tricking the brain to adopt a new mindset and reinforcing it with action. The third thing, we have to learn and we have to apply that learning. When we come to Sunday morning service, when we go to a class, we learn lots of stuff. How are we putting that learning into practice? Right? So we, we want to read the books from New Thought. And, and that helps to deepen our understanding of the science of mind principles. But we need to put it into practice. Find even one little lesson that you learn from one of the classes and say, I'm going to put this in practice this week. And apply that learning to your everyday living. Number four, surround yourself with like-minded people. Start hanging out with people that are very successful, if success is something that you want. If you want to deepen your consciousness of truth, rub shoulders with the, the practitioners and the ministers. I'm sure that we won't mind, because we, will, we, will, we are just the vessels of God's wisdom, and we are happy to share that wisdom with you. Right? It's easier to adopt a new mindset when you see that it's already working for other people. <coughs> Learn how they think and adapt their daily habits to match their mindset. Create number five, create new habits to support that new perspective. Doing so at the same time, doing, doing something at the same time every day will help shift your mindset and reinforce new thinking. For example, schedule prayer and meditation at the same time every morning. Or you can program a sound on your phone at a certain time. I do a, a, an alarm at a certain time, twice a day, to remind me to stop, breathe, become present in stillness just for a few moments. If I'm in a workshop, I might turn my back to the flip chart, take a deep breath, and just do a quick affirmation. Nobody, nobody is any the wiser. Number six, learn how to do spiritual mind healing treatment. Treatment or affirmative prayer enables us to shift our mind. To shift, you can shift your mind so as to start manifesting in the way that you desire. It is based on the recognition and acceptance that God is all there is. We are one with God. That there is no spot where God is not. That we are all spiritual beings here and now. And that all the abundance of the universe is already ours if we can accept and embody it. It allows us to consciously clear away the grime of false beliefs of a condition to reveal the truth that was always there. While science of mind ministers and practitioners are trained in how to effectively use treatment, our faith is grounded in the idea that this is something that anyone and everyone can do. Come to class or make an appointment with a minister or practitioner to learn how. Then try it for yourself and experience some amazing results in your life. You know, Ernest Holmes tells us that the mind must reach a place where it no longer remembers the past with anxiety or looks into the future with uncertainty. If you believe in God, if you believe in your own soul, then 
no matter what situation confronts you, you can be happy. And speaking of situations, huh, last Saturday, my son was robbed of his mobile device. You know, just came in behind him. He obviously didn't see the person. And the person just stuck the hand in his pocket, took it and disappeared. Now, he was obviously devastated. His iPhone provides not only connection and entertainment, but it, but it has great access accessibility features for someone who is blind. He went through the multiple emotions of um, shock and despair and anger, everything. And then late on Saturday night, um, this is like two in the morning, so I should say Monday morning, he said, Mom, this will never happen to me again. It is a wake up call for me to begin to take action that I've been procrastinating about. If I'm to move forward, I have to move my mind from violation to liberation. How is that for a matter of perspective? And then he declared, I will get a new phone and I will accomplish my goals sooner rather than later. Definite perspective. By Monday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, two days, his new phone was purchased, mostly paid for by his own efforts. I mean, if I could, it, the details just blow my mind away. All he said, he put, on, he put out, my phone was stolen. Does anybody have an, a phone they're not using that I could get? And that was that. <clears throat> Go fund me, phone with case, with insure. <laughs> Ask and it shall be given unto you. It's all a matter of perspective. So I, I believe that he still has some healing to do. There is still, there's still some very, you know, soft spots that, you know, we have to work through. So, but for the most part, there is, there is, there is a focus which I'm really, really um, proud about. I am assured that he has the tools because I know he has absorbed so much from me. It's very painful when he can throw signs of mine back at me, especially when I'm off the wagon in my behavior. It's not pretty. But it then says to me, if I step away from my ego, that Kevin has been learning these principles all these years. The late Dr. Wayne Dyer says, if, if, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Our divine good friends will always be manifest in perfect alignment with the height of our belief and the depth of our faith. And so it must, as John 1, verses 4, sorry, 1 John, chapter 4, verse 4 says, and we all know this, so if you know it, you can say it with me. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Let's say that together. But let us use it in the first person. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Greater is he who is in me, that which is in me, that presence and power of God, that which guides me, drives me, uh, allows me to, to, to carve a path in this thing called life. So the science of mind helps us to develop our mind. It helps us to improve the quality of our lives. And it helps us to break the trance of acceptance that circumstances are just the way things are. So as we recognize the ways in which the world seeks to hypnotize us, limitation, um, hypnotize us into fear, limitation, lack and scarcity, we can choose to be filled by the inner source and stop, substance of our being and become a radiating presence of joy, peace, prosperity, and fulfillment. It all is a matter of perspective. Namaste. Thank you. You asked why? You've got the answers. <laughs> Upgrade your mindset. Be aware of your self-talk. 
practice what you learn, and by the way, do your assignments when Reverend John sets them, or when anybody, any speaker sets them. Go and do the mindset, because that, do, do, go and do the assignment, that's how you change the mindset. You associate with like-minded people, you create new habits to reinforce new thought patterns, and you learn how to pray. Commit to dwell on that which is true and uplifting. And don't focus on the wise. Focus on the practice. So now,